political stalwart, statesman, three-time Prime Minister of India, prolific poet, Atal Bihari Vajpayee passed away on Thursday after battling prolonged illness. He was 93 years old. The leader was cremated with full state honours in New Delhi today. It was an emotional farewell for one of the tallest leaders of the country as the entire nation joined in praying and in paying their tribute to the former Prime Minister. Several leading politicians cutting across party lines paid a homage to him. Some well-known faces from the world of Bollywood also made their way to Vajpayee's official residence on Krishna Menon Marg to pay their last respects. The mortal remains were then taken to the BJP headquarters at Deen Dayal Upadhyay Marg, where party workers had gathered to get a final glimpse of their leader. A sea of supporters was part of the former Prime Minister's last journey as Prime Minister Narendra Modi, BJP President Amit Shah, along with other party leaders, led the procession. Elaborate security arrangements were put in place. As many as 25 roads were closed, 20,000 security personnel were deployed in the national capital today. Atal Bihari Vajpayee was cremated at the Smriti Sthal on the banks of the Yamuna River. Politicians from across parties and foreign dignitaries were present. Leaders from Sark countries also attended the funeral to pay their last respects. Vajpayee's adopted daughter, Namita Bhattacharya, lit the funeral pyre. <laughs> The grief of Atal Bihari Vajpayee's death was felt across cultures and borders. Leaders from Sark nations flew into India this morning to pay their last respects to the former Indian Prime Minister. As Prime Minister, he tried to bring India closer to its immediate neighbourhood and the world. And on the day of his final journey, the world came together to bid the beloved statesman a tearful adieu. King of Bhutan, Jigme Hesar Namgyal Wangchuk was the first world leader to fly into New Delhi on Friday morning. After paying homage to Vajpayee at the BJP headquarters, Wangchuk paid last respects to the former Prime Minister at New Delhi's Smriti Sthal. Joining the King of Bhutan was the former Afghan President Hamid Karzai. Foreign Minister of Bangladesh Abul Hassan Mahmood Ali also paid respects to the leader. Among other Sark countries, the foreign ministers of Nepal and Sri Lanka, Pradeep Kumar Gyawali and Lakshman Kirela were present. Pakistan, which recalled Vajpayee's statesmanship, sent in a delegation led by the country's acting law and information minister, Barrister Ali Zafar. Also joining India in its grief was Mauritius, which in an unprecedented move decided to fly its national flag at half-mast along with the tricolour. The British High Commission in Delhi flew its national flag, the Union Jack, at half-mast in honour of Vajpayee. Condolence messages poured in from around the world, including Russia and the United States. In his message, Russian President Vladimir Putin called Vajpayee an outstanding statesman. US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said that both the US and India benefited from Vajpayee's wisdom. Sri Lankan President Maitri Pala Sirisena described Vajpayee as a visionary leader and an ardent defender of democracy, and Maldivian President Abdullah Yamin recalled how his island country had gained due to Vajpayee. It was a day when neighbours stood together to share the grief. It was a moment which only a leader of Vajpayee's stature could weave together. Pure Report, we are. Atal Bihari Vajpayee was always part of the Sankh, but he had friends across the political and ideological spectrum. He led a coalition of 13 parties for five years. He was respected by political friends and foes alike, and even in death, he brought together all the warring sides of Indian politics. 
हमारे साथ हमारे खिलाफ जमघट करके और हमें हटाने का प्रयास कर रहे हैं उन्हें प्रयास करने का पूरा अधिकार है अब पार्लियामेंटेरियन पावर एक्सलेंस एन एबल एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर a leader who commanded respect across the political spectrum atal bihari vajpayee was a man who carried 24 parties along in the coalition government he led in india from the janasangh to the bjp vajpayee remained a steadfast practitioner of the right of center politics that gave a counterpoint to the congress but in death as in life he united the entire political fraternity in his final journey he carried a microcosm of the nation and its varied political opinion with him it was not just the bharatiya janata party which he led that was in mourning rahul gandhi and former prime minister manmohan singh of the congress sat next to the top bjp leadership at the memorial site farooq abdullah mulayam singh yadav nitish kumar हर सिमरत कौर बादल ए राजा लीडर्स ऑफ अ रेंज ऑफ पार्टीज सच एज द नेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस द द्रविड मुनेत्र करगम द जनता दल यूनाइटेड द अकाली दल एंड तृणमूल कांग्रेस रिप्रेजेंटिंग द नॉर्थ साउथ वेस्ट एंड ईस्ट ऑफ इंडिया वर आल्सो प्रेजेंट स्पीकिंग टू वियन कांग्रेस लीडर सलमान खुर्शीद एक्सप्लेन वाई वाजपेयी कैरेज सच एन अपील अक्रॉस द पोलिटिकल स्पेक्ट्रम for me he really represents in a sense in a sense the final dawn the final dusk or the closing of the neruvian era he was the the ideal opposition leader uh, to the ideal prime ministership back in 2001 pakistan backed terrorist organization attacked the indian parliament in normal course political blame game would have followed but vajpay knew how to unite the country with a singular speech on thursday sonia gandhi paid glowing tributes to vajpay recalling his contribution to the public life sonia gandhi described vajpay as a towering figure a spell binding orator a visionary leader and a patriot to the core Vajpayee was a man with a very large heart and a real spirit of magnanimity a man who always treated everyone with respect and courtesy she said It's been more than 10 years since Vajpayee had been seen in public life a poet a politician a much respected statesman he treated all of india as his family he treated all of india as his family when he passed away all were united in grief bureau report vion for the moment we are heading to kerala it's witnessing its worst floods in a century look at these images
God's own country is facing the wrath of nature. 13 out of the 14 districts of Kerala have been put on high alert. Home to over 33 million people, the state has been battered with monsoon like never before. Both the centre and the state government are now working to contain the damage. The National Agency for Crisis Management met for a second time in two days in New Delhi to review rescue and relief operations. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard and the National Disaster Response Force, the NDRF, have all been called in. Additional resources of all these agencies have been mobilized. These organizations were asked to provide boats, helicopters, life jackets, life boys, raincoats, gun boots and all other paraphernalia that could be of use to those affected. The central government has deployed 339 motor boats to reach people marooned in far-flung areas, in flood-affected areas, which is pretty much the entire state. The Navy has deployed an additional 51 boats along with teams of expert divers to aid rescue operations. The Coast Guard has deployed 30 boats along with their own rescue personnel. Life-saving gear is being stocked and dispatched in the thousands. The center has provided roughly 8,000 life jackets, the Navy another 1,000. With people trapped in their homes for days, both the state and the central government are trying to speed up delivery of food to those in need. More than 100,000 food packets have already been distributed and arrangements are being made to supply another 100,000 packets in the hours to come. Provisions have also been made for the supply of milk powder. In situations like these, aerial patrolling is of great help for the authorities. The Indian Air Force has put 23 helicopters and 11 transport aircraft to work. Many more are making their way to the flood-ravaged state. Some of the aircraft are being flown in from as far as Yelahanka in Karnataka and Nagpur in Maharashtra. 16 sorties have been conducted in the last two days alone. Other than monitoring, rescuing and relaying information, these aircraft are also dispatching food supplies. More than 1,600 food packets were airdropped in the last few hours. The Indian Navy offered the Kochi Naval Airstrip to be used by civilian airlines as the Kochi airport remains shut. The runway and the airport premises are flooded, as you can see. The Indian Army has pressed 10 columns into service and 10 engineering task forces to deal with large structures that could be under the threat of collapse. Most of the dams in the state are flowing above capacity. The gates of the Iduki Dam, remember, were opened for the first time in more than two and a half decades. The Indian Railways has also pitched in more than 120,000 water bottles have been arranged for those affected. Another consignment of the same size is ready to be dispatched. A special train carrying 2.9 lakh litres of drinking water will reach Kayakulam town in Aleppi district, hopefully in a few hours. After a phone call between the Indian Prime Minister and the Chief Minister of Kerala, the army was asked to move to the flood-ravaged state. Army units from Pune and Bhopal were rushed to Kerala yesterday and within a day they managed to rescue more than 100 people. The Indian Army has had a record of saving lives in such situations and natural calamities. Our next report sums up their brave efforts in Kerala. Every time India is struck by a natural disaster. Every time the people of India look for help. It is India's armed forces that rise to the occasion. And so it is in the southern Indian state of Kerala. The army, the navy, and the Air Force have come together to help. From rescuing those stranded across the 14 districts of the state to providing food and shelter to those who have been ravaged by nature's fury. India's armed forces have carried out some incredible operations to save lives just in the nick of time. Like this woman who was about to deliver a baby, she was blessed with a baby boy within minutes of being airlifted. The armed forces were the first to arrive on the scene of calamity, a calamity that is growing worse by the day. And they will not leave until the job is done. just like they do on India's borders. 
India's soldiers are putting their own lives in peril to save those of the people of Kerala. Just the way they saved the lives of the people of Jammu and Kashmir in the 2015 floods and the people of Chennai in 2016 and innumerable other occasions. They are the ones the nation turns to in times of adversity. Here's saluting the saviors in God's own country. Bureau Report, we are. Well, the immediate focus in Kerala is on the relief and rehabilitation efforts, and rightly so. The larger challenge will crop up once the flood waters recede. More than 200,000 people that are now in relief centers may not just have lost their homes, but also their means of earning. The damage to roads, power transmission networks, telephone towers is extensive. It will take months to set right. The floods have also caused losses to the tune of 8,000 crore rupees so far. And the situation isn't improving anytime soon. A final audit will only be possible once the rains halt. Kerala is, a la is largely a plantation and agro-based economy. Standing crop and plantations of banana, rubber, cardamom and pepper have been devastated as the floods have been concentrated in the plantation districts of Iduki, Kotayam and Wayanad. It may also take a long time for soil fertility to be restored as the rampaging flood waters may have washed off the topsoil. The state also depends on tourism for income. Sadly, the floods have come at a time when the tourist season was just about to start towards the end of September. With air, road and rail networks thrown out of gear, the backwaters flooded, the hills becoming treacherous terrain, the tourism sector is expected to suffer major setbacks in Kerala. Since the day he decided to contest the election, US President Donald Trump has been fighting a dirty war with the media. He is now known for his ugly public spats with them. But more than 300 American media outlets have now decided to fight back. They've launched a campaign to counter President Trump's attacks. Take a look. More than 300 media organizations in America have launched their own war against Trump. They may be spread out all over America, but on Thursday, they chose to speak in one voice. They hit back at US President Donald Trump for his relentless attacks on the news media. The campaign, led by American daily Boston Globe, is an attempt to denounce Trump's war against the media. Does everybody like the press? They can make anything bad because they are the fake, fake, disgusting news. It wasn't until I became a politician that I realized how nasty, how mean, how uh, vicious, and how fake the press can be. The fake media, they make up stories. They have no sources in many cases. They say a source says there is no such thing. The Boston Globe said in its editorial, today in the United States, we have a president who has created a mantra that members of the media who do not blatantly support the policies of the current US administration are the enemy of the people. The New York Times said, News reporters and editors are human and make mistakes. Correcting them is core to our job. But insisting that truths you don't like are fake news is dangerous to the lifeblood of democracy. And calling journalists the enemy of the people is dangerous. Period. Fake. They have to leave that word. Fake media. Fake news. Only fake news. Just fake. It's fake. Trump has attacked the media repeatedly since his campaigning days. He fired three tweets to hit back at the media campaign, saying that fake media is the opposition party and the press has been pushing a political agenda. A poll conducted by Ipsos found that one out of eight Americans want Trump to shut down mainstream media organizations like CNN, The Washington Post and The New York Times. Another poll conducted by the Quinnipiac University suggests that 51% of Republican voters believe that the media is indeed the enemy of the people. Bureau Report, we on. Donald Trump 
has been known for his ugly spats with the media and uh, he's been doing that since he took office. His combative approach towards the media has been a regular feature since 2016 when he was just a candidate running for the presidency. Back then, the Trump campaign routinely barred media outlets from covering rallies. But the U.S. president gained worldwide recognition through the media, so why is he shooting the messenger now? Trump's frequent attacks are often aimed at those media outlets that are critical of him. By attacking them, the U.S. president is trying to essentially discredit those reports by calling them fake news. It's his favorite expression. It's ironic that more than 300 media organizations now have to run a campaign, a counter campaign rather, to emphasize on their freedom of speech. The U.S. Constitution lists the freedom of the press as a fundamental right. America's founding fathers consider the freedom of the press as, quote unquote, one of the great bulwarks of liberty. The war between Trump and the media is not going to help either. The organizations that are part of this campaign are not just concerned about their basic freedoms, they're also worried that the verbal attacks by the US president could put the lives of journalists in America at risk.